We are not taking away anyone's guns. But we will require that the serial numbers on these grandfathered weapons be associated with the owner's FOID account. Why is the Pablo Registry of the Firearms? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand, because what you want to do is prevent people from purchasing uh, assault weapons in the state, and you want to make sure that you know where those very, very deadly weapons are, who owns them, when and if a crime is committed with one of them. But you are turning legal gun owners with this bill into felons. So my, I don't know how you're going to enforce this. You can't put us all in jail. Your new bail law just said you can't do that. Uh, we feel this law that has recently passed um, is unconstitutional and how we uh, do not want to um, or how we are not going to uh, enforce uh, any of that law. Well, you don't get to choose which laws you comply with in the state of Illinois. Let's be clear. Our founding fathers' original intent, they guaranteed, they assured, they understood what inalienable rights are. And those are rights that are given to we, the people, people, individuals, by God. And actually, it is up to the government to protect those rights. One year ago today, the state of Illinois enacted a gun and magazine ban January 10th, 2023. Since then, there have been a slew of lawsuits and compliance rates are... Um, low by all standards. Welcome in Bishop on Air, a live to tape documentary special uh, here with Bishop on Air as we look past the, uh, the, the past year and how this law was ultimately uh, put together. So I appreciate you guys taking part and uh, being here for this. Uh, but uh, let's get right on into it. There's tons to tackle. Of course, we've got uh, the law that was enacted, but uh, there were some uh, predicates of why some who supported a gun and magazine ban wanted this law. And a lot of it deals with what happened on July 4th of 2022 in Highland Park, where you had a uh, gunman uh, shoot and kill multiple people, injuring dozens uh, using a semi-automatic rifle. And while that case continues on in the prosecution against the accused, Robert Cremo uh, III, uh, you've got uh, those who uh, used that as a, the why of passing a gun and magazine ban. Uh, but some of the things about that particular case uh, need to be highlighted as well when it comes to uh, the July 4th shooting because of the, uh, the clear and present danger reports that local law enforcement gave to Illinois State Police before the suspect actually got a firearm owner ID card uh, after his father signed off on it, uh, but he had that clear and present danger report. Well, Illinois State Police were asked about that clear and present danger report, and here's Illinois State Police Director Brendan Kelly. I believe this is back in uh, December of 2022 uh, when they were discussing these things. And if you look at the report that was understandably submitted by the Highland Park Police Department in response to the information that they had, and then you look at the law that with regards to clear and present danger, what the statute requires, what is that threshold? That did not meet that threshold. And that, that the consensus from uh, old analysts and new analysts alike, we, we vetted it multiple times, would that have met the threshold? And the consensus is no. After that point, there being no new developments, no additional arrest, no additional criminal record, no new mental health prohibitor, nothing that indicated that the individual had been uh, checked into a, a mental health facility that requires a new report. No, no basis for a firearms restraining order had been filed or an order of protection. All the things that are under the law that would be able to help us stop from issuing a, a firearms identification card. None of those factors were present at the time. And uh, state police said that they then changed their rules to allow for consideration of such clear and present danger reports. Back then, I asked Illinois State Rifle Association's Richard Pearson about this. Well, what, what, what it shows is that uh, somehow those records have to be kept, even though a, a person does not have a FOID card and apply to their uh, application for a FOID card if they make one. So, I mean, you know, there's all along the line, we find things that, that, that fail in the system and all these fail, failures lined up, uh, wind up being a disaster, you know? 
and uh, ultimately that individual getting a firearm owner identification card and allegedly uh, conducting those uh, heinous acts against innocent people. Uh, but it still led to legislators crafting a bill to ban certain semi-automatic firearms. And during committee hearings in December of 2022, you had uh, proponents and opponents uh, sound off on how they feel this law uh, may impact their communities. You know, and if this ban was to take effect, still we, we got hearts that need to be changed, minds that need to be changed, so the banker will pull the trigger. Because if all guns were non-existent and the heart and the mind is not changed, if something's wrong mentally, they're going to what? They're going to go with bats. They're going to go with knives. They're gonna pick anything that they can pick up, screwdrivers. What they do in the penitentiary, you know? So I'm talking about a heart and a mind change and resources brought to uh, a community brought together with those resources so we can heal the minds and hearts of our people to bring a better community worldwide not just chicago worldwide don't turn a deaf ear i know i'm speaking i'm preaching to the choir here but to the others who don't support this don't look away don't turn a deaf ear we we have to do something we don't have to live like this and we have to make changes and i very much support the ban on assault weapons and the large capacity magazines. You have a highway named after a great journalist, one who wanted women's rights, advocate for truth, anti-lynching. She had this to say, a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home and should be used for that protection, which the law refuses to give. Ida B. Wells, if you had to make it more modern, an AR-15, a shotgun, AK, doesn't matter. That is legally bought, that is legally owned. To have the place for honor in every black, gay, bi, Arab, Jew, doesn't matter. So be again, using protection. You've got uh, the ongoing uh, debate there uh, before the law ultimately passed and even more back and forth during uh, another committee because they had several committees in December of 2022 talking about the ban on certain semi-automatic firearms. Uh, and Illinois State Police Director Brendan Kelly was available then as well to answer questions about how they're going to get compliance of the law, not just of the prohibition of the sale of such items, but also the registry of such items because the law that passed January 10th uh, and was enacted uh, in 2023, that included a registry starting October 1st with the deadline of January 1st this year, just last week, uh, and uh, how that compliance is gonna be brought about. So Illinois State Police Director Brendan Kelly had some reaction to that. Yeah, my, my feeling is the only state police, you give us enough resources, we can put a man on the moon if that's what the General Assembly wants, wants us to do. Looking at the mission that is outlined here within this bill, we believe we can accomplish that and, and we'll be able to answer ready so long as we have that support and those resources. I presume there's hundreds of thousands of these listed firearms legally owned today. And if this passes, they won't be. How, how are you going to enforce compliance? And that will be part of our, our normal enforcement efforts. When we find a, a, something that is not in compliance with the law, either because it's a prohibitor or, or it's a ghost gun or it's a switch or whatever the case may be that makes it unlawful, that will just be one of the categories that our, our, our folks will be enforcing as they come across, across these firearms. But in terms of the individuals who that will be allowed to retain them and they'll be allowed to keep them, that's what some of those additional resources will need for the, uh, the unsworn personnel to set up essentially kiosks to make it convenient for folks to be able to uh, to do the uh, the process that's outlined uh, in this legislation so they can keep those the information is on file with the Illinois State Police pursuant to this for the pursuant to the statute that'll be less of an enforcement mechanism and more of a compliance mechanism um, the bottom line is this this bill keeps a lot of systemic racism as it applies to the Second Amendment I could take my firearms my mags I can go across the border I have the means what about the people that don't? What about the people you, you, you're just gonna criminalize them? There's over 70 counties in Illinois there, 2A sanctuary counties. Those folks aren't gonna get arrested. So my, I don't know how you're gonna enforce this. You can't put us all in jail. Your new bail law just said you can't do that. You will have civil disobedience to where people are gonna register things. They're not gonna surrender things. They're not gonna turn them in. So I ask you, what is the enforcement mechanism? Are you gonna send the state police house to house? 
Are you, because as one local law enforcement chief put it in my area, he said, Todd, you're telling me that I have to go potentially arrest my neighbors, the people I go to church with, the people on my school, son's football squad, the people that come over and barbecue, the guys I see in the bar, they're all now felons. So the argument's pretty strong, uh, as you heard from Ed Sullivan and Todd Vandermeide, uh, in response to some of the questions and concerns during committee hearings last, uh, well, in 2022. Uh, then you get to actual action of getting the law uh, set up uh, before it passed. And in committee, you had uh, House Speaker Chris Welch uh, talk about uh, the, uh, the the concerns people have and what the law ultimately is going to lead to. Uh, and here's uh, Chris Welch during committee. If this bill were to become law, there will be no removal of these weapons from people who already own them. And I really want to highlight that because we always hear this narrative that we're taking away guns from lawful gun owners. And you had uh, others, uh, stakeholders, uh, talking about uh, what they're ultimately doing. Here's Chris Welch, some more. We are not taking away anyone's guns. But we will require that the serial numbers on these grandfathered weapons be associated with the owner's FOID account. There must be accountability. Other stakeholders sharing their thoughts and concerns. We want to make it more expensive. We want to make it more trying. And we want to restrict the black community from their rights. It is their right. It's their Second Amendment right. We have to fight for that right, right? because we were considered three-fifths of a man. I would no longer be considered three-fifths of a man. Don't take my rights. It was uh, Courtney Redman, um, and uh, he's a Second Amendment advocate, but you also had uh, Republican lawmakers share their concerns. Here's C.D. Davidsmeyer. Are we pushing people away from the current legal system? Because if I'm going to be illegal and, and a felony is worse than not having a FOID card, right? Class four, class three, class two felony is worse than the punishment for not having a FOID card. My concern is that we're pushing people away from supporting the current legal system that is currently in place. And David's Meyer said that it's uh, ultimately gonna turn a lot of people into felons he had concerns about. Uh, but then it got onto the uh, House and Senate floor where you had uh, people making the case for the ban, uh, but also others saying that they are not going to comply with the ban uh, in the House. Andrew Chesney uh, shared some of the thoughts about whether or not this law uh, is going to make the state safer. And I do agree, Speaker and Governor, I do agree that our area, our state, has crime problems. But I can't help to note the area that the crime problems predominantly resonate are in the areas you represent. Why? We want to lock them up. You want to cut them loose. It's that simple. All of our neighbors disagree with every one of you on the other side of the aisle on gun regulation, or as I would say, gun confiscation every state and yet you sit here at one in the morning and talk to us about safety and all we're asking for is to lock up the bad and empower and embrace the good that's all we've asked governor that's all we've asked, Mr. Speaker. Representative, your time has expired. And uh, after uh, rushing this through both chambers and the House, it ultimately did pass. Senate Bill 2226, having received a constitutional majority, is hereby declared passed. And this is even with all of the uh, uh, legal uh, options that people had to, to sue the state over this, uh, but also uh, questioning the process of the bill coming together. I think they had to gut and replace a bill about insurance regulation uh, and then replace it with uh, a measure to ban the sale of certain types of firearms. Uh, well, shortly after the law passed on January 10th, a year ago today, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker signed that measure.
And afterwards, the governor took questions and uh, talked about uh, compliance and how uh, you had sheriffs across the state and state's attorneys across the state say that they were not going to enforce this law. Well, you don't get to choose which laws you comply with in the state of Illinois. Let's be clear. The fact the fact is that, yes, there are, of course, people who are trying to politically grandstand, uh, who want to make a name for themselves by claiming that they will not comply. But the reality is that the state police is responsible for enforcement, as are all law enforcement all across this state. And they will, in fact, do their job or they won't be in their job. So the governor also asked about the pending legal challenges that were expected. Uh, NRA and the other groups uh, that were opposed to this, that they're going to try to take this to court. So, um, you know, my reaction, of course, is this is a constitutional bill. The law here that we uh, now have enacted uh, is constitutional. There was a lot of thought that went into it to make sure that it would be. And obviously, things will go through the courts and they'll make their determinations, but I feel very confident. So uh, we're doing a live-to-tape documentary here, uh, a rough draft of sorts, because I'm surely going to have to put together a uh, completed version uh, that's uh, more produced than just uh, lining up these clips and airing them for you here live on this one-year anniversary of the Protect Illinois Communities Act being put into place. It's Bishop on Air. Thank you for tuning in. I uh, appreciate you guys being here. Uh, continuing on, the volley back and forth about enforcement and whether sheriffs are going to actually enforce this measure. Uh, you had sheriffs hold a news conference, including... Uh, those from uh, Crawford County and Jasper County and others. Uh, Crawford County uh, Sheriff uh, William Rutan had this to say uh, when he uh, held that news conference with other sheriffs from across the state about enforcing this measure. Uh, I am a constitutional officer. I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States first and foremost. And uh, that me and, and several of the other sheriffs in, in the state, like most of us, um, and uh, uh, several states' attorneys, along with uh, the Crawford County state's attorney, have uh, you know um, uh, sent out these letters uh, stating that uh, uh, we feel this law that has recently passed um, is unconstitutional, and how we uh, do not want to, um, or how we are not going to uh, uh, enforce. Uh, any of that law. And the governor reacting to some of that as more sheriffs came out saying that they're not going to enforce this law. Well, let's be clear. They took an oath of office to enforce the laws of the state of Illinois, and they will do so. Uh, at this point, as you know, people need to register their existing weapons. We've outlawed the purchase, the sale of these assault weapons. Um, and it's up to individuals who own weapons today to come forward. They have to uh, file a paper with the state police, as you know. That's not something that requires the intervention of a sheriff, for example. Um, and, uh, and I think that they're doing it as a matter of political grandstanding. Uh, they hope to delay long enough to uh, have this run through the court system. And even uh, Attorney General Kwame Raoul shared his thoughts about sheriffs not wanting to enforce the well, law. First of all, ditto. They, they, uh, um, you know, uh, I, as Attorney General, I get to weigh into my legislators as to what our opinion is on pending legislation. Sheriffs have a sheriff's association. They have an opportunity to do the same. But once the legislature passes a, a legislation and the governor attaches his signature to it, it's the law of the land that uh, they have the duty that they've sworn an oath to, to enforce. I will say also that uh, as law enforcement agencies, there's overlap in jurisdiction as well. Um, so if they don't do their jobs, there are other people available to do the job. And uh, Jasper County Sheriff Brandon Francis uh, said that he wasn't concerned about the uh, ramifications of not enforcing a what he said was an unconstitutional law. Uh, I don't I don't have any any fear from, you know, not in, enforcing this. Um, when I took my oath as, as sheriff, um, the, the second line in my oath uh, was to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Uh, I think we're, we're all in agreement. There are several sheriffs that put out uh, letters the majority of, in the majority of the state. I think it was around 90% uh, of the sheriffs put out a statement. 
stating that they would support the Constitution. So I uh, obviously there's discretion in, in which law that, that we enforce, uh, but a law that would be a um, violation of our constitutional rights is something that we would not enforce. I mean, that's, you know, we don't commonly see that, but in this case, it's happened. So. I think a lot of sheriffs have uh, sustained that position, even now that the law is a year old. Uh, but after all of that, you had court cases that were filed in state and federal court. The first case was from attorney Thomas Mag in state court, where he brought up arguments about the F Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. And that was transferred to federal court, but there were other cases in federal court as well that were filed. Uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker reacting to that uh, during the spring about what's exactly Exactly going on with all of these lawsuits and uh, here he is uh, almost a year ago talking about all of those lawsuits that were filed no it's just more of the same these are folks who are in the super minority um, among the public super minority in terms of elected officials um, people who lost elections uh, who uh, now seeing that they don't like policy that they couldn't win at the ballot box on uh, that they now hope that they can take to state court and win with a local judge. Um, and so this obviously we're going to have to play all this out in state courts uh, for the next several months. And there's a federal case as well that will be carried out. But, um, you know, I think that it, it, they'll lose in the end. This is a constitutional law. It's been in effect in eight other states. We're simply the ninth state to have passed and signed and put into law an assault weapons ban that will save lives. One of the individual attorneys that uh, filed lawsuits uh, was attorney Thomas DeVore, uh, who secured thousands of temporary restraining orders from several different state courts. Uh, and ultimately that being appealed and the appeals courts actually upheld those temporary restraining orders. Talked with DeVore back in the day on that issue. Absent the record being fully, fully vetted and, and generated, Equal protection was by far the, the uh, most pertinent argument in the short run. So the appellate court agreed with us and said that the TRO stands because there's been an equal protection violation. The equal protection argument is, is that this law carves out seven categories of people based on their profession that they're not bound by this law. They can buy all the AR-15s they want. They can buy all the 50 calibers they want. They can buy all of the 30-round magazines they want purely based upon where they work. Uh, current retired police, prison guards, county jailers, uh, security people, and the government tried to argue that that was based upon their extensive training. That was the reason that they were able to be carved out. And there's a lot of problems with that, Greg. So a lot of arguments about training, about equal protections. Uh, talked with Maura Hershauer briefly about the appeals court siding with the plaintiffs. We've been expecting kind of any twist and turn that can come, so I feel really confident that we have um, passed the best bill we possibly can and that our um, attorneys are ready to fight it and still feeling positive. You know, I think um, I stand with my constituents who are tired of waking up every morning to hear about another mass shooting, whether it be in our state or in states across the country. We took a stand here in Illinois that our constituents wanted us to, and um, I'm proud of the work we did. So the lawsuits, the lawsuits continued to stack up, uh, and you had uh, even state-level lawsuits from uh, Dan Calkins, state representative, and uh, some of the uh, the arguments that he was bringing forward on that issue as well. Uh, here's some of how that played out in, in state courts with attorney Jerry Stocks arguing in Macon County. Already in the state of Illinois, over 75% of the sheriffs say that they won't enforce it. We have uh, county uh, courts saying that they find it unconstitutional. We have a fifth district appellate court opinion declaring it unconstitutional on equal protection grounds. We have chaos right now, and we need to have an order that is clear that this application, that these orders already entered by the fifth district and in this proceeding uh, makes it applicable in all applications. 
and the argument ultimately leading to a success in the Macon County Court. Uh, but uh, Calkins said that uh, getting a temporary restraining order was important. Uh, and then you get Calkins ultimately um, fast forwarding. He secured uh, final judgment in Macon County. Well, today Judge Forbes uh, issued us a uh, ruling on my uh, lawsuit, on our lawsuit. Uh, Perry Lewin and I and members of the uh, legal gun owners of Macon County, our association. And the judge granted all of us uh, a temporary restraining order against this uh, unconstitutional gun grab law. And uh, when they had that order come down, they were looking for some clarity on if that meant it was statewide or if it was just for Calkins and other plaintiffs. Calkins contended that it was statewide. Last Friday, Judge Forbes uh, issued a final judgment. And I'm going to use a couple of words here that are legal and uh, lawyers are listening in and people uh, want to know what's going on, you can ask an attorney. Uh, it was a Rule 18 order, a final judgment, uh, declaring uh, the uh, law unconstitutional. And in order to make a direct appeal to the Illinois Supreme Court under this uh, Rule 302A1, uh, the Attorney General has to agree that the law has been invalidated and it negates the very existence of the law and in all applications. And that is the essence of, uh, of this appeal. But Attorney General Kwame Raoul did not agree with that assessment. Um, through another uh, reporter in Chicago, I had the question asked about what the state's guidance on this. Greg Bishop, thanks, Fun. <laughs> uh, what is the current guidance to ISP for enforcing the assault weapon? Um, that uh, it is the it is the law. <laughs> that it is the law, except for with regards to uh, the plaintiffs in the in, in the respective lawsuits. Um, so again, there was confusion there, even after a uh, county court had final judgment on the law, uh, but it was appealed to the Illinois Supreme Court. Calkins's case was. Uh, after uh, bypassing the appellate court, and you had then questions being brought up about conflicts of interest with two Illinois Supreme Court justice candidates in 2022 that ultimately got elected, uh, and Governor J.B. Pritzker being somebody who provided a substantial amount of those campaign contributions, a million dollars each to Judge Rochford and O'Brien, uh, and I asked the governor back in March about uh, these political donations that he made. I, I am sure this is something that the right wing is trying to stir up. I know you've written about it. Um, the fact of the matter is I supported candidates who were running all across the board. Um, if you're suggesting that uh, the fact that I gave money to, let's say, the Democratic Party or to the committees that supported uh, candidates means that everybody who received any money has to recuse themselves from anything to do with the state of Illinois, that's ridiculous. And I've certainly never asked anybody to vote a certain way or decide on a case a certain way. I would never do that. I never have. I never will. Um, and these are independent judges, and they didn't go around and campaign on things, you know, that, that they thought would win my support for them. I believe in them. I supported them like lots of other people did. So again, uh, the governor saying that uh, it was ridiculous to assume that uh, he uh, was was te trying to you know compromise somebody's position, uh, and I asked Dan Calkins about that question uh, back in in April. Um, that's up to them. They have, we're not asking for that. We're not pursuing that. That's not an issue. Our issue is that this is an unconstitutional law. Our process goes to the Illinois Supreme Court where we expect to get a fair hearing and defend uh, our judgment. And we're not concerned about that. 
But ultimately, Calkins was concerned about that and his attorneys filing recusal motions that were ultimately denied by those two Illinois Supreme Court justices. And this is a concern even outside of the state's judicial integrity. I talked with uh, Chris Forsyth uh, out of an organization out of Colorado, and he shared some of his thoughts about the importance of judicial integrity when it comes to uh, political contributions and how those are treated uh, when they are hearing cases uh, that may involve people who gave them money. Oh, judicial integrity is imperative for our American democracy. The judicial branch is, and we want it to be fair um, and um, honest and to have integrity so we can have confidence in the opinions that the judicial branch, <coughs> excuse me, that the judicial branch um, issues. If we don't have confidence in the opinions the judicial branch issues, then our, our judicial branch is failing. And he goes on to talk about what are some of the things that could lead to questions around if a judge has integrity. With judicial integrity. Sure, political donations can lead to issues of judicial integrity, and the United States Supreme Court has said so. Um, in some cases, they have found political donations to be so great that there's a conflict of interest that's impermissible. In other words, the lowest standard for judges is really in the United States Constitution. That's where whether a fair and impartial um, trial was was had, and the Supreme Court has found a situation where you know somebody gave so much money to a judge that that just you know <laughs> made the ultimate opinion that the judge issued in the case involving that donor. I mean, invalid. So, uh, again, Chris Forsyth sharing the concerns there are about judicial integrity for these types of things. And even more, the governor was asked about the campaign contributions. And the question another reporter asked was, uh, what was he looking to get from those sizable campaign contributions? Well, my hope is that good people get elected to public office. That's why I think you would contribute or anybody else in this room would contribute to somebody. I would also point out that. Uh, you know, unlike uh, what some people are putting forward uh, among the right wing, the truth of the matter is that uh, my name is on these suits because I am an official representative of the state of Illinois. When I became governor, there were suits that were outstanding, and Rauner's name was removed from those suits, and my name was put on them. It had nothing to do with me specifically, just the fact that I happened to be governor at that time and this time. Uh, so, you know, the, the conflicts that have been alleged are just, you know, false. Uh, and I, I'm, you know, must say that I think people who run for judge uh, do it for the right reasons. Um, and I think that people who give to candidates for judge do it for the right reasons. And judges ultimately are required to do to make their independent decisions about the cases. Uh, and I, I think that's what judges that uh, any of us support should do and I hope will do. And we are uh, doing a live to tape documentary a year in for Illinois Protect Illinois Communities Act, the ban on 170 plus semi-automatic rifles, shotguns, handguns, magazines over certain capacities, a gun registration with the deadline of January 1st. Uh, it's Bishop on air. Thanks for hanging out. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell uh, as we are live each and every weekday morning. And this is just like a rough draft of sorts as I continue to compile all of this information. Um, we'll have a, you know, surely once we get some finality when that'll be who knows but we'll do a deeper uh, more produced documentary but on the one year anniversary I wanted to be sure that we uh, kind of reflected back to where we've come from uh, but fast forward to March of uh, last year you had uh, uh, Illinois Gun Owner Lobby Day with the Illinois State Rifle Association uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker being asked about the thousands of people who arrived in Springfield to lobby for their Second Amendment rights well, let's start with just everybody's voice should be heard. If people want to gather and make their point, this is a, obviously the city to do it in uh, with the legislators here uh, in session. So uh, we welcome everybody, all views. Um, we also, of course, are here, what, three days after um, this terrible shooting in Nashville. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm we all grieve, I think, for the three adults and three very young children who died that day. Um, but also deeply concerned about the kinds of weapons that were used in that attack. One person with a couple of 
uh, assault-style weapons uh, and other weapons on her. And um, we pray that will never happen in the state of Illinois, and certainly an assault weapons ban will help us to limit the possibility of that ever occurring. So what message do you have for what could be potentially thousands of Illinois and Smart I, you know, again, we welcome their voices. Um, we can all have disagreements on important issues, uh, but but their voices should be heard. So the voices were heard. They met at a convention center in Springfield. The Illinois State Rifle Association's Richard Pearson leading some of that conversation. This case that we're looking at will change uh, not only Illinois, but every state in the union. It eats time, it eats money, and that's what the state wants because the state has the ability to use my money to fight me. I have to use my money and your money to fight them. So they use our money against us, but that doesn't mean we're going away. That doesn't mean we're going to give up. We are going to fight on no matter what. So we have a, a, bat a batter of uh, other cases. We are going to batter them with lawsuits, and we're going to keep them busy constantly. And indeed, those lawsuits continue to stack up. As with iGold each and every year, you've got uh, people marching through the streets of Springfield with their uh, voices being heard. iGold this year, by the way, go check out the Illinois State Rifle Association's website and get details on when that is. I believe it's coming up in April, but I might be uh, corrected on that. More from uh, a rally outside the Capitol in March last year. We need you. We have to sit across the aisle having these bad bills shoved down our throats. We need you today. We need you every single day. If you're from an area that your legislator is not proud to be up here, tell them that you need them to be up here and stand up for you. Again, not just today, every day of the year, because that's what it's going to take. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Chapin Rose, 51st Senate District. Lawrence County to Vermilion County, straight up the Indiana line. Welcome to Springfield, everybody. Thank you for supporting our Second Amendment. I want to say one thing that Chris Miller picked up on. You don't need a law to protect you in your own home. God gave us the right to protect us in our own home. This is from on high. It doesn't come from a politician. It doesn't come from anybody in this building. It sure as hell doesn't come from J.B. Pritzker. Each one of us has a right to defend ourselves, our families, and our homes. End of story. That's why it's in the Constitution of the United States. So the uh, obvious uh, mantra has been all along that those who oppose this uh, see it as a infringement of the Constitution. Uh, so that all aside, you've got uh, in April um, a judge ultimately granting a preliminary injunction in a federal case. And that was after a hearing, I believe, in April. Uh, here's Todd Vandermeid following that hearing in the Southern District of Illinois talking about how he felt that the case was going to go. Well, we've seen reductions in 60 percent or more in some stores as far as what their, you know, what their availability to sell, because it's not just the firearms. It's the components, it's magazines, it's stocks, it's parts. This bill, the, this law does not allow me to repair a firearm if I don't already have the parts in my house. I cannot buy a detent spring. I cannot buy a barrel to replace a shot out barrel or any of that other, or any of those other components within this. They refuse to acknowledge how far and broad their ban goes. Because I'd even contend that based under Section 24 1.10 of the magazine ban, the 870 shotgun is illegal for sale in the state of Illinois under their magazine ban. And Vandermeid uh, felt that after the judge, Stephen McGlynn, heard the case on a preliminary basis, he would grant that injunction. Uh, here's Thomas Mag talking about that after April of 2023, where Judge McGlynn uh, ultimately, uh, you know, heard the case. Uh, Judge McGlynn had obviously read all the briefs. He uh, was obviously familiar with the topic. Uh, I did not think much of the state's argument. The state's argument simply seemed to boil down to that the legislature can do what they want. They seem to ignore the Bruin uh, case out of the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm optimistic that in the coming days or weeks, uh, 
Judge McGlynn will enter the uh, TRO that we've all requested. The weak point in the defendant's argument boils down to that they're arguing that the legislature is not bound by the Constitution. That's the exact opposite of how it really works. The Constitution controls what the legislature does. The legislature doesn't get to control what the Constitution does. And after that hearing, a few weeks go by, and Judge McGlynn issuing that preliminary injunction, just a preliminary motion, not, not the merits of the case, which halted the law from being enforced for six days before the state appealed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and uh, had a stay put on that injunction, essentially saying that injunction's not in place. Uh, so that was uh, an interesting uh, series of events there. But while that's federal case continued to play out in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals last spring, you had Calkins bring his case to the Illinois Supreme Court where those arguments were made uh, with the state making their defense. The circuit court held that the assault weapons and large capacity magazine restrictions in the Protect Illinois Communities Act violated the equal protection and special legislation clauses of the Illinois Constitution. Those are the claims that are at issue here. Claim present an equal protection violation and the plaintiffs are not similarly situated to either. With respect to those in the grandfather provision who already had assault weapons and large capacity magazines, the plaintiffs are not similarly situated to them you know, to the extent that they don't already have assault weapons um, because they don't have that reliance interest that people who already had assault weapons and large capacity magazines do. With respect to the seven enumerated professions in the law, um, the members of the general public are not similarly situated to those in those professions because members of those professions are sort of presumed to exercise greater responsibility in the safe handling and storage of firearms. So a lot of the arguments uh, surrounded the idea of equal protections and uh, whether or not uh, certain classes of individuals could uh, you know, be carved out while others aren't. And you had uh, Jerry Stocks, the attorney for Dan Calkins in the Illinois Supreme Court make his case. Protection and special legislation overlap say they're not coterminous because of the applicability of can we write a general law would be the additional element to a special legislation challenge. But every fact that is in the equal protection cause of action, every last one of those facts is included in the special legislation. And the word additional is not replace everything I already have stated. It is saying that we have additional rights that are implicated by this statutory scheme that not only invades the right to possess firearms in the home, which is un undisputedly a protected right, but it is reaching broader to create how we can do non-commercial transfer, inheritance even, uh, it is permeating a whole range of transactions. The statute. There are seven categories of exempted individuals, all of whom must undergo uh, training to maintain their exempt status. And um, the plain, in, in your, this case, the plaintiffs, you're saying, well, they have um, FOID cards, correct? They have the right to bear arms for self-defense in the home. The FOID card doesn't ex give them that right. The FOID card is just a mechanism by which the state can assure that they're not otherwise disqualified. We do not advocate, nor do we believe, that the Second Amendment tolerates in any manner these prohibitions of assault weapons based on the mere fortuity of when you may acquire them. But setting that aside, if everyone would have to regulate their firearm because of the purpose that we want to keep track uh, of where those arms are, Equal protection requires that that fundamental individual right be applied to all citizens the same because it is an individual right. And so again, that's uh, Jerry Stocks from uh, the Illinois Supreme Court. And afterwards, I was able to uh, take part in a, a press gaggle uh, with the Illinois Attorney General who uh, sounded off on his thoughts of how the hearing went and the direction that they're going and ultimately the um, the um, the priorities that those who support the law have. And do you want more people to go out and get those weapons and, and go to parades and, and commit mass shootings? I don't, and I don't think the legislature does, does either. Uh, during the course of this case, uh, um, making its way through, through, through the system, there have been um, use of such weapons in multiple cases, almost every week or every other week. 
And I think there's a rational basis to stop the proliferation of these types of weapons in the hands of people that'll, that'll do mass damage, take, take, take many lives um, in a matter of seconds. The, the question of training, can I not get the same type of training that law enforcement can get or security or wardens can get? Can I like... Well, you play a different role, right? It's not just a question of training. You, you, you're not in a law enforcement role, I don't think. So the question of training, uh, the attorney general reacting to, I got Stocks' reaction to the AG. Why can't I just go get the same training that a law enforcement officer has and you know, pay for it out of pocket or whatever? Uh, his response was that... Uh, from his understanding, I'm not law enforcement, or others, other people that are impacted by this are not law enforcement. It, it's privilege and benefit, uh, that special legislation violation, but in the concealed carry, ultimately, they had to accord an opportunity for training. Um, and there's a lot of principles that I fear get conflated because everybody views the issue through the prism of their desired outcome. So then you, you start twisting the principles and the analytics. You don't work through it. And uh, so it's a problem. Cases that are charged such as this, uh, it's, you know, it just comes with it. And uh, Stocks also, even though two of the Illinois Supreme Court justices denied recusing themselves from the case, back in May, after the Illinois Supreme Court heard the case, he said that the recusal motion he still stands by it and uh, was looking at uh, possible action moving forward. I remain and stand behind the issues raised in that motion because I submit that it is the prudent course for our judiciary to be highly guarded uh, on those issues. And I recognize that they got to be careful not to you know, disqualify themselves out of every case. I mean, that's it's a tough call. And um, Illinois politics makes it really tough on judges uh, because they have to be elected in this state. So I, I recognize those issues, but uh, you know, my personal view as a downstater is uh, it's pretty darn corrupt in Illinois. And I know our perception downstate is that we, we wanna see that the process and the institutions, uh, not aspersions on the individuals, but that the institutions uh, and our procedures do more uh, to protect against that. And again, uh, flash forward, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court in August, ultimately siding with the state uh, and saying that uh, Calkins didn't prove his case. And uh, Calkins then said that he was going to be eyeballing, possibly taking the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, which he did. They sent a conference, and this week the U.S. Supreme Court denying Calkins' request that they hear the case. Uh, but back in August, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker took part in a, uh, a fireside chat about gun control and uh, here's a, a clip of him talking about his thoughts on the odds of a, um, a, a legal challenge succeeding to knock the law down or whether or not the law will stand you know I, I don't know what percentage chance to put on it but it is not zero uh, chance and it is not you know 30 percent chance I think it's better than that that we will win. I don't know what percent to put on it. I just think that we have a pretty good argument and it's demonstrated by uh, the quality of the bill that got passed and signed here in Illinois and the uh, commentary of the appellate court judges. You know, we can't allow people to have shoulder fired missiles. There's some list, limit to what we can allow people to have uh, and they're gonna have to recognize that it shouldn't be a popularity. And uh, based on that, uh, I asked the governor uh, before the Illinois Supreme Court ruled about why he would sign a law. He said he felt uh, had about a one in three chance of succeeding uh, in the challenge of uh, the federal or state courts. Here's the governor back in August. Why sign the law if you, had, you, know, if you know that uh, it's a little bit better than 30 percent chance of uh, survive? I don't think that's exactly what I said. I was trying to articulate, though, that you just don't know what's going to happen in the federal courts and that as of late, the appointees to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, are people who unfortunately want to take away the rights of parade goers and people who live in our neighborhoods to live safely and to not have assault weapons uh, that, that are attacking their uh, local communities. So I, I want to be clear, I don't know what the outcomes are going to be in, in you know, court cases until they come out. 
Um, I did not know until you just mentioned it that the Illinois Supreme Court is going to come out with their decision tomorrow. I'm hopeful, but no idea how they'll uh, resolve it. It does matter what happens at the state level and state court, but ultimately the Supreme Court likely will be ruling on this. And so whatever happens there will ultimately, I hate to use the word Trump, whatever happens in our state courts. So again, uh, the governor being asked about these things uh, in, in August before the Illinois Supreme Court ultimately ruled, which they did. They sided with the state against Calkins. Uh, but the uh, questions of what happens next after the U.S. Supreme Court denied Calkins' case is interesting. This while a state level case from Tom DeVore, while the Illinois Supreme Court ruled against Calkins. The lower court vacated the divorce cases. Well, divorce back in court, uh, trying to get those cases reinstated. So we'll see what ultimately happens there as lawsuits persist in all of this. But also questions about the rules, because when a law is passed, the administration has to set up rules to essentially govern and execute those laws. While the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, a legislative body looking at these things, uh, had some questions about all of this. Here's Ryan Spain during a recent JCAR hearing, uh, urging the state police to do more to inform the public. Uh, we've had discussions with the state police, uh, representatives of whom are here today in the room with us. Uh, they understand uh, the very lengthy, detailed uh, questions, areas of ambigu ambiguity uh, that we're looking for resolution. And the state police have agreed to respond to questions that will be generated and facilitated to them through this committee and have agreed to also hold additional public hearings for the permanent rulemaking associated with this topic. And so we have a lot of discussion that will continue to take place. Uh, JCAR will be meeting again in Springfield in November, uh, early November during the second week of veto session, and then again here in Chicago in December. So expect a lot of condi uh, continued discussion on this topic and an ability to provide further clarification uh, to questions, whether they're specific firearm uh, attachment, magazine questions, uh, issues about private security contractors. And uh, the questions continued on, and Jay Carr ultimately uh, telling the Illinois Supreme or the Illinois State Police to have these hearings. But uh, more from the rules, uh, you have uh, Dan Eldridge, Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois, uh, raising questions about those rules and how they were applied. Published the rules, the, the state police published their rules around, especially around the registry on September the 18th. And so we had a very limited time to respond. Uh, the dealer organization, FFLIL, did file a response before the deadline with the state police requesting three hearings, uh, one in Northern Illinois outside of Chicago, one in Central Illinois, and one in Southern Illinois. Our thinking being that it's really quite burdensome for uh, for people throughout the state to have to travel to see to, to Chicago or travel to Springfield for uh, for a public hearing. Uh, what we got out of JCAR today was uh, it, it is what it is. Um, we're we're glad that uh, the call for hearings was heard, and uh, I think the public hearings should be very informative for the state police uh, with respect to the um, the rules that they published. And those public hearings uh, transpiring with a lot of questions and a uh, few answers, and even those who attended in person having trouble hearing at one particular hearing. Uh, Eldridge talks about the impact on gun dealers. Our members uh, have seen business decline anywhere between 10 and 50 or 60 percent versus last year. This is a very seasonal business, so the right way to measure it is, you know, how was my September versus last September? And uh, how much of that is uh, the, the ban on sales of centerfire uh, magazine fed rifles and, and other items? And how much of it is macroeconomic headwinds and higher interest rates and, and less discretionary spending is hard to say, but it's certainly not helpful. Um, and and as, you know, in commerce, it's not helpful. Uh, and people's ability to defend themselves is not helpful. And, and hopefully the, uh, the, the people that are sitting in judgment on this will look at current events and, and understand the importance uh, of an armed citizenry, of a prepared citizenry uh, in terms of self-defense uh, on an individual and on a community level. 
and get back to the sensible uh, nature of people having the best tools possible with which to defend themselves. So again, uh, the ongoing debate about the state's gun and magazine ban even spilling into some of these hearings. Here is uh, the hearing that happened in Springfield with uh, uh, State Representative Brad Halbrook asking questions of Illinois State Police. I want to be clear that we know this public hearing is taking place because the governor and his radical left agenda. He and his Democrat legislators passed this bill and then laid it at your feet to have to deal with it. I support law enforcement unapologetically, and we know this is not your fault. However, there are questions that need to be answered. And the questions he had in, uh, ranged from uh, enforcement of this so measure. So here's the questions I have for you today. What happens when hundreds of thousands of gun owners are non-compliant overnight and otherwise, they're just otherwise totally law-abiding citizens? What is going to be their punishment for non-compliance? Sir, my intent is to take down your questions and provide okay. I mean, I can submit these speech. later in, in writing so you, that we don't, I mean, I'm looking for a response. Okay, so my initial response would be that we will turn to the bill, and I believe the bill sets forth penalties for failure to file your endorsement affidavit, and so it will be up to each individual state's attorney in the 102 counties to decide how they will enforce that. So again, uh, up to the state's attorneys and how they're going to enforce this, and we heard earlier how state's attorneys and sheriffs across the state have uh, said that they're not going to enforce this. Continuing on with a live-to-tape documentary here on the one-year anniversary of the Protecting Illinois Communities Act, the state's gun and magazine ban being signed. Uh, then you had Hal Brook during a uh, public hearing in Springfield uh, late last year uh, ask questions about enforcement of this. And, subsequent and then the events next is, step is what is the, just what just the let's go through the progression. The first of offense is a class A. Second and subsequences are class three felonies. So again, the question is, what is the definition of first offense and subsequent uh, offenses after that? Okay, again, that's going to be up to the state's attorney in the courts. But typically, that would mean that you have to have a conviction for the first offense before it would move on to a second offense. Okay. And there were a lot of other questions. Josh Rutowski uh, with the Outdoor Sports Organization questioned the issue of airsoft uh, guns. Are you familiar with airsoft? Yes, I am. Small plastic pellet firearms. They use the same attachment points that modern sporting rifles use. So if an individual only possesses airsoft rifles and has a forward grip for their airsoft rifle, do they have to register that forward grip as an assault weapons attachment? because it could be attached as a second grip onto a modern sporting rifle. It would not be our understanding that it needs to be endorsed. However, that is an issue for all 102 counties to decide how they will enforce, and I cannot tell you how they will or won't enforce that. So the, a lot of the questions were meant to craft the updated rules that JCAR had to consider, and uh, they did indeed file second notice rules uh, but those rules have not been implemented uh, and the January 1st deadline to register has come and gone with those overarching questions about what needs to be registered still looming. Then there was a third hearing down in was it Caseyville uh, that uh, included proponents uh, talking about their support of the Protecting Illinois Communities Act. And uh, here's some of how that played out with a uh, much larger crowd in that Southern Illinois hearing with Illinois State Police and uh, hearing public comments that were provided in written form. Moms Demand Action is a grassroots movement of Americans fighting for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence. We work to pass stronger gun laws and to close the loopholes that jeopardize the safety of our families. The Metro East group of the Illinois Moms Demand Chapter encompasses East St. Louis and areas to the Northeast in the metro area. Law enforcement agencies, including the ISP, are charged with enforcing the Protect Illinois Communities Act throughout the state. ISP will continue to enforce the FOID Act and Article 24 of the Criminal Code of 2012 by partnering with local law enforcement through our Violent Crimes Intelligence Task Force. The task force is a collaborative effort to reduce and prevent illegal possession and use of firearms, firearm-related homicides, and other violent crimes. So state police uh, sharing uh, more about uh, all of that. And they heard from the likes of Valinda Rowe. They heard from Ed Sullivan. Uh, they even heard from uh, state rep state former state Senator Darren Bailey about uh, his concerns of all of this and how he really isn't uh, interested in complying with this, uh, but also calling out Illinois State Police Director Brendan Kelly. 
I have utmost respect for the Illinois State Police, and I am so sorry for this tough situation that you are in. I am curious of one thing, probably the only question I have. This is home territory to Illinois State Police Director Brandon Kelly. Is there a reason why he is not here today to face his friends and neighbors? Thank you. Our Director Kelly is otherwise occupied within the state, um, and he's been here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can tell our governor, who is comfortably residing in his gated mansion with private security, that if he wants our firearms, he is going to have to pry them from my cold, dead hands. This is America. Our founding fathers understood the importance of an armed citizenry as a safeguard against tyranny. We will uphold that legacy with unwavering determination. Thank you. So again, Darren Bailey there uh, making his uh, and, uh, thoughts heard, uh, but uh, you had others who, uh, after the committee hearing, they uh, took time to chat with uh, members of the media, and that included uh, Illinois State Rifle Association's Ed Sullivan, who had this to say. No, I, I, I know exactly what happens. For the first offense, I get a misdemeanor. For the second offense, I get a felony. It won't happen to me because I will not have a firearm in this state. I'm going to comply with the law. I'm just not going to register the firearms. Okay, so but, register. but what about folks that don't have the ability to move their firearms out of state? I mean, think about the cost that some of the people that just, they just can't pay for it. I mean, this is a completely regressive law against anybody that doesn't have the means. I happen to have the means, and I live right on the border, so I can move them to a storage unit across the way. So Sullivan uh, saying that he was going to move his firearms, of course, that January 1st deadline uh, having come and gone, uh, but those rules still very much up in the air as to how it's going to be enforced. Here are uh, a Republican and a Democrat uh, representative of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules talking about the rules process even after those three public hearings. Uh, we continue to work with the Illinois State Police. They've uh, promulgated emer emergency rules regarding uh, the registration of certain firearms. They just finished having their public hearings. They had three throughout the state. So now it's time to collect all of the feedback, which was very, very extensive. And they've committed to reporting back, answering those very meaningful questions for citizens, for uh, responsible firearm owners throughout the state, and uh, addressing changes that should be made uh, at our December JCAR meeting. Yeah, we need to move quickly, though. We need to understand what changes are happening because there is uh, a January 1st uh, requirement. So I think uh, it would be better to see some adjustments from the state of police. Uh, in December rather than waiting for after a deadline has passed and then understanding what changes might be made for permanent rules. Yeah, I think there are a number of unresolved issues, so I look forward to seeing if they come any closer to resolution. I think ultimately we're waiting for some action on this now at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court of the United States is going to need to weigh in on these issues, and I expect that they will at some time. But you raise a lot of uh, very fair questions for in the meantime, what does this mean for uh, law-abiding firearm owners in the state of Illinois who continue to raise a lot of legitimate questions to the state of police, uh, state police about um, uh, their requirements and responsibilities? But should there be a vote to suspend? Well, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I um, called for a vote to issue a formal objection, uh, which was resulted in a tie during our October meeting. I, I don't want to guess about what sort of action the uh, department will take um, at any subsequent meeting. I will say that the state police uh, have done a good job of reaching out for public input. That's what we've asked them to do. They um, held three community hearings to take input. That's not something they had to do, but we requested they do that. They have. And um, I think they have a very difficult job in front of them right now, and I think they're doing it well. I don't know what sort of, off the top of my head, I don't know what the calendar looks like, what sort of statutory deadlines we're dealing with. So because of that, I, I don't want to speculate, and I just don't know what the, the time frame is without checking with staff. I, I wouldn't want to speculate. You know, we have a saying that Every law is constitutional until a court tells you it's not. So uh, the state police has to go along with the rulemaking as contemplated by the law. 
with this emergency rule in place, though, for 150 days from late September, mm -hmm. it puts you know the question way past January 1st. Um, with these emergency rules in place and the and the question possibly in front of the Supreme Court, isn't it judicious to suspend the rules until I, I, a date out? I think, as I said, we have to assume that the law is constitutional until a court tells us it's not. Again, that's. Um State Senator Bill Cunningham, before that, State Representative Ryan Spain, the Republican, Cunningham, the Democrat, uh, co-chairs of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. They meet next week, and it's possible they could bring up the second notice rules that were filed about the state gun and magazine ban. But again, here we are. It's what going to be you know, two weeks after the January 1st deadline. Uh, and the registration numbers in the three-month window uh, remained below 1% until that final week, where it jumped up to... 1.22% of the state's firearm owner identification card holders that registered firearms. And back in November, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker and State Representative Bob Morgan reacted to those low registration numbers. Here's uh, the, the governor reacting to that. So I hate that mainstream media are picking up right-wing media talking points, so let me correct you a little bit. Yeah, there are 2.4 million FOID card holders in the state of Illinois. 2.4 million people do not have assault weapons. So when you talk about the percentage of people who are filing and registering, it's a much higher percentage than what you've cited of the people who are required to do so. I can tell you, at least for me, that I think all of us um, you know, take our time sometimes when we know the deadline is two and a half months hence, that we'll find the time eventually to go online, which is what they need to do, and to register uh, as they're required to do. So freedom, we're simply recognizing that we want people to be safe and don't think that it's a, you know, weapon that keeps you safe uh, to have something, you know, that fires that many bullets in that short a period of time. I don't know if if Representative Morgan wants to address it as well. I, I would echo everything the governor just mentioned. This is new for the state of Illinois. As you noted, historically, we've registered people with our FOIA car registration. This is the first time we're we registering weapons themselves. I also think there are a lot of individuals who have these weapons or are considering whether to sell them to someone out of state, which is a provision in the law that they're allowed to do. So I, I do think this is a, a function of cramming for the test that people will wait to the last minute. They'll see, there, there's obviously, we're still waiting for a ruling from the Federal Court of Appeals. Some people are waiting for that. But I also expect that number to, to uh, increase as people recognize that they want to be law-abiding citizens, and they want to be consistent with state law, and they will register uh, their existing legacy weapons. Otherwise, they're risking their FOID card. And, and I think the vast, vast majority of people are just committed to being law-abiding citizens the way they are now. And the uh, appeals court did ultimately side with the state on that, but that was on a preliminary injunction, not on the merits. The merits of the case still very much alive. Governor J.B. Pritzker last month being asked about continued confusion with the rules not being in place. Here's what he had to say at the governor's mansion. How can you enforce a law where there's confusion of the rules? Though? You've got this possibly leading to a class three felony, people would lose their rights. To well, that's, that's an exaggeration that often occurs in right-wing media. The reality is that most people really do understand these rules. And by the way, people are actually signing up, uh, registering their automatic uh, assault weapons, their, um, their uh, uh, high speed, high capacity magazines rather. and. Um, and, you know, as we get closer to it, we're seeing more and more people actually do what they're required to do under the law. But I also asked the governor about why there needs to be a gun ban registration. Why have a registry of these firearms? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. Because what you want to do is prevent people from purchasing uh, assault weapons in the state. And you want to make sure that you know where those very, very deadly weapons are, who owns them when and if a crime is committed with one of them. But even after the uh, law was ultimately help upheld uh, on preliminary motions, you had uh, sheriffs and state's attorneys across the state say they're not going to enforce this. I talked with uh, Kankakee County Sheriff Mike Downey weeks ago, and here's what he had to say. Where I individually stand is um, if, if you are a lawful gun owner, and there are people out there who, who are really opposed to the FOID system, you know, the card. Um, but if you are a lawful gun owner and have a FOID, and you utilize that gun for your self-protection or hunting or whatever you use that for, and it's lawful, um, the sheriff's office uh, really shouldn't 
you know, be too concerned about it uh, because that's, you know, what people use to protect themselves. And, you know, we're not going to, um, we are not going to go out and actively uh, go to people who we think might have a gun because if we were to go to somebody's house, we technically would have to have a warrant. I also talked with uh, Richard Pearson, the Illinois State Rifle Association Executive Director, before January 1st. Exactly. People are going to register their firearms. They don't trust the government. They know, uh, as happened in Connecticut, you know, they had a similar law two years ago, and now the government's calling for confiscation of those firearms because now they know who has them and where they are. And not only that, people paid the government to have their guns confiscated because it costs a, a $25 registration fee. So you're paying the government to find us to spy on you. And uh, people don't like that. And uh, they, the, uh, the, the number of gun owners in this country has never been higher. Uh, people are, are rebelling against this. And so uh, I look forward to the Supreme Court overruling uh, the uh, Pike Act. So ISRA says they're planning to take their case to the U.S. Supreme Court. You have the Beavis case looking to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so all of those things still very much active. But on January 1st, you had former state Senator Darren Bailey uh, share a video saying that he is not going to comply with this. And he says that he did not register any firearms when I chatted with Our him. Our founding father's original intent they guaranteed, they assured, they understood what inalienable rights are. And those are rights that are given to we, the people, people, individuals, by God. And actually, it is up to the government to protect those rights. So there you have it, uh, a look back at the past year of the state's Protecting Illinois Communities Act with a live-to-tape documentary. Uh, appreciate you guys checking this out. Uh, and, of course, I am way past my time here. So that's all we've got with Bishop on air. Greatly appreciate you guys taking the time with us. And uh, stay tuned. We've got uh, many more things coming up each and every weekday morning here with Bishop on air.